This is Space Time, Series 23, Episode 108. Coming up on Space Time, NASA's Dragonfly drone mission to Titan, the Red Planet's close approach to the Earth, and a new cosmic commode rockets into orbit. We look at the dynamic space study. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. A new study has found relatively fresh exposed water ice in impact craters on the surface of the Saturnian moon Titan. The findings, reported in the journal Astronomy and Astrophysics, could prove beneficial in plans for the proposed Dragonfly mission to send a drone aircraft to Titan. The new data is based on observations by the European Space Agency's visible and infrared mapping spectrometer aboard NASA's Cassini spacecraft. Cassini orbited the ring world of Saturn and its moons between 2004 and 2017 and launching the Huygens lander down to the surface of Titan. On Titan, atmospheric processes bury ice under a thick layer of sand-like organic material. In fact, when Huygens touched down on the surface, scientists described the ground as feeling like wet sand. In Titan's dry equatorial regions, the sand piles up but at higher, wetter latitudes, surface streams erode away the sand. The study's lead author, geologist Catherine Nish from Western University, says there's more sand on Titan per area than anywhere else in the solar system. She says that for nearly two decades now, space sciences have been focusing the majority of its funds and research on Mars in the search for the building blocks of life. And yet, there are dynamic worlds like Saturn's moon Titan, which may actually have more going on biologically than the red planet. Titan is Saturn's largest moon, the second biggest moon in the solar system, and it's larger than the planet Mercury. Importantly, it's the only world in the solar system other than Earth where clouds rain liquid down onto the surface, forming streams and rivers which then flow into lakes and seas. But unlike the Earth's water-based hydrological cycle, Titan's rains are made of methane and ethane. On Titan, temperatures are so cold, water is frozen so hard it forms the bedrock. And it doesn't end there. Titan's atmosphere is about 10 times as thick as the Earth's atmosphere, and it's primarily nitrogen laced with methane and ethane. All this forms a dense hydrocarbon haze high in the Moon's stratosphere, where it's broken down by sunlight. Scientists say it's all very reminiscent of what the primordial Earth might have been like. It all makes Titan a compelling astrobiological target. Its surface contains abundant complex carbon-rich chemistry, with both liquid water and liquid hydrocarbons possibly forming a prebiotic primordial soup. In order to get a better understanding of Titan and its environment, NASA's planning the Dragonfly astrobiology mission for Titan, slated for launch in 2027. Dragonfly will send a robotic rotocraft down to the surface, landing in the Shangri-La dune fields in December 2034. It'll study prebiotic chemistry, performing multiple vertical takeoffs and landings to fly to a variety of different locations, thereby allowing Dragonfly to study the local terrain and analyse the surrounding geology in a number of locations. This is Space Time. Still to come, the red planet Mars putting out its best show in years right now. And a new cosmic commode launches into orbit. All that and more still to come on Space Time. Right now, the red planet Mars is putting on its best celestial show in years. You see, thanks to their orbits... The Earth and Mars reach their closest position to each other every 26 months. And that just happens to be now. This year, Mars's closest approach to Earth was on October the 6th, when the red planet was just 62,069,570 kilometres away. Now, that's not as near as the 2003 close approach, when it came to just 55.76 million kilometres of the Earth. But it is the closest the red planet will get for the next 15 years. 
In fact, Mars won't beat its 2003 close encounter until August the 28th, 2287, when the red planet comes to just 55.69 million kilometres of the Earth. And that's still not the record. See, the minimum distance between the Earth and Mars can get down to about 54.6 million kilometres, but that doesn't happen very often. If the Earth and Mars had perfectly circular orbits, then their minimum distances would always be the same. However, they have elliptical or egg-shaped orbits. The orbits of Mars and the Earth are also slightly tilted with respect to each other. And then there's the effect of the gravitational tidal actions of the other planets, all constantly changing the shape of their orbits by just a bit. The gas giant Jupiter especially influences the orbit of Mars. Now, all of these factors combine to mean that not all close encounters are equal. But every two years or so, when Mars and Earth are close to each other, the red planet appears especially bright in our night sky. It makes it easy to see, both with telescopes and even the unaided eye. Right now, Mars will be visible for much of the night near the ecliptic, roughly the same part of the sky where the Sun and the Moon travel, and it'll be at its highest point at about midnight. And when Mars and Earth are at their closest, it's usually the best time to go to Mars. That's why many Mars missions take the advantage of the close distance to visit the red planet. So depending on budgets, you'll see Mars missions are launched roughly every two years. Mars' close approach is also closely related to Mars' opposition and Mars' retrograde. Opposition's happening right now, so it's the best time to view Mars because it's directly on the opposite side of the Earth from the Sun. So Mars rises at sunset, it's visible all night long, and then sets at sunrise. And because the sunlight's shining on it from behind the Earth, it also looks brighter. Still, take advantage of the spectacle while it's there. Mars will quickly become fainter as it and the Earth travel further away from each other on their respective orbits around the Sun. And interestingly, Mars will appear to be moving backwards in relation to background stars. It'll be in what's called retrograde. That happens as the Earth overtakes it due to Earth's orbit being closer to the Sun than the orbit of Mars. The next Mars close approach won't happen until December the 8th, 2022. The current issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine has a special feature on Mars close approach. Joining us now with the details is the magazine's editor, Jonathan Nally. Okay, Stuart, so next few weeks we've got Mars season coming up. Best time to see it, mid-October particularly, is going to be the best time to see Mars. In fact, this will be the best view we'll have of Mars for many years to come. And that's due to its distance from us, because it's going to be quite close. So in the lead-up to this viewing season, we're going to give you all the information you need to study the planet. We've got a, a full Mars observing guide in the magazine. So the best times to see it, the right viewing conditions, what sort of telescope equipment you need to use, and what to watch out for on the red planet. So we're talking things like the South Polar Ice Cap, uh, any dust storms that pop up, the mountain ranges, huge extinct volcanoes on Mars. You can actually see all the way from Earth if you have a big enough telescope. And if you have the right kind of gear, you might even be able to spot the two little tiny moons of Mars going around. We've got a, an app you can use. Phobos and Deimos. Phobos and Deimos. We've got an app you can use to work out when they should be visible from your location and your time, wherever you are on Earth. So you need, need a reasonable size telescope to do that. But, but for the rest, any telescope will give you a pretty good view of Mars. So uh, grab this chance, if you've got good weather, uh, to have a look at Mars when it's close up. Because when other times of the year when Mars is a long way away, it looks less than half the size. And Mars is a small thing to begin with, small planets. So really, you need to take the opportunity to look at Mars when it's close and when it looks big. And, and, it, and it doesn't last long. So get out there, if you've got a telescope or you know someone who has, have a look at the red planet because this is going to be the best viewing conditions for about, I think it's about 10 years or so. Um, we'll still get you know, more close approaches of Mars uh, over the years, but just the way the orbits work, this is going to be a particularly close one. That's Jonathan Nally, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And don't forget, if you're having trouble getting your copy of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine from your usual retailer because of the current lockdown and travel restrictions, you can always get a print or digital subscription and have the magazine delivered directly to your letterbox or inbox. Subscribing's easy. Just go to skyandtelescope.com.au. That's skyandtelescope.com.au and you'll never be left in the dark again. This is Space Time. Still to come, a new cosmic commode rockets into orbit. And later in the science report, growing fears that one of the world's most important food crops, the sweet potato, could become another victim of global warming. All that and more still to come on Space Time.
OK, let's take a break from our show for a word from our sponsor, ExpressVPN, rated number one by Tech Radar. You may be wondering why you need a virtual private network. Well, it's in the name. It's all about privacy. Do you really want big brother tech companies, hackers, governments, and who knows who else snooping in on your online activities? Now, you might not have anything to hide, but it's still really creepy, and it could be dangerous for you and those you care about. Also, how often do you run across a website and you want to get information from it, but you find out that they're geo-blocked? It's all very frustrating, and it's becoming an increasing problem. And that's where ExpressVPN can help you. ExpressVPN's a simple and efficient way to protect your online privacy. It's internet without borders from the world's leading VPN provider. So, protect your online privacy today and find out how you can get three months free at tryexpressvpn.com slash space. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space for three months free with a one-year package. Visit tryexpressvpn.com slash space to learn more. And of course, you'll find the link details in the show notes and on our website. That's tryexpressvpn.com slash space. And now, it's back to our show. You're listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. To go where no man has gone before might no longer be accurate, but a new space toilet has nevertheless been delivered to the International Space Station. The new cosmic commode was part of the payload aboard the Cygnus NG-14 cargo ship, which successfully docked with the International Space Station two days after launching aboard a Northrop Grumman Antares rocket from NASA's Wallops Island Flight Facility on the Virginian Mid-Atlantic coast. Five, four, three, two, one. Can we have engine ignition? Engine start and liftoff. The SS Kolpnachavla takes flight, sights set on the International Space Station. Pitch and roll programmer in. Equal systems are nominal. Engines at 100%. Attitude nominal. Equal substance nominal. Engines are steady and nominal. 100%. Altitude 20,000 feet. One minute into the flight, everything looking good on Antares. Passing through max Q. Attitude nominal. Engines at 100%. Antares passing through the area of maximum dynamic pressure. Uh, 50,000 feet. Attitude nominal. All vehicle subsystems are nominal. Coming up on the two-minute mark into the flight, everything looking good. Just passing 100,000 feet. Attitude nominal. Vehicle subsystems nominal. Engines remain at 100%. Good reports from the range control center at Wallops. 30 seconds to throttle down. Throttle down is the precursor to main engine cutoff for the first stage. Coming up on the three-minute mark into the flight. Engines at 55% thrust. Standing by for main engine cutoff on the first stage. Main engine cutoff. Stage one separation. Attitude nominal. Stage one separation confirmed from the range control center. And Terry is flying straight and true. Antares in coast phase until proper conditions for fairing separation and stage two ignition are achieved. Fair- fairing separation confirmed. Cygnus now exposed uh, to the atmosphere as it uh, continues its trek uphill to its preliminary orbit. Stage two ignition. This will be about a two minute, 44 second burn of the second stage engine. Attitude nominal. Vehicle subsystems nominal, 140 kilometers. Coming up on the five minute mark into the flight. All systems continue nominal. Altitude 150 kilometers. The uh, second stage burnout uh, is scheduled at about the six minute, 51 second mark into the flight. Altitude 170 kilometers, roughly one minute to stage two burnout. Altitude 184 kilometers, all systems nominal, roughly 30 seconds to stage two burnout. Six minutes, 40 seconds into the flight, standing by for stage two burnout. Stage two tail off, stage two burnout. And Cygnus has reached uh, the preliminary orbital insertion. Terries will coast for roughly 100 seconds prior to payload separation. And as you heard, uh, the next uh, major event will be uh, Cygnus's separation from the second stage. Attitude nominal. Cygnus uh, has begun its journey to reach the International Space Station early Monday morning. All vehicle subsystems nominal. Altitude 191 kilometers, roughly one minute to payload separation. Liftoff occurred uh, right on the dime at uh, 816 and 14 seconds p.m. Central Time, 916, 14 p.m. Eastern Time. The International Space Station uh, and its three uh, crew members who are asleep at this hour approaching the southwest coast of Australia. Altitude remains uh, 192 kilometers, 
roughly 30 seconds to payload separation. All systems nominal. At the time of uh, Cygnus's separation from the second stage, the operations will uh, move to Dulles, Virginia, and the Cygnus uh, flight control room under the direction of Mission Director Zach Dwyer. Cygnus separation. Spacecraft separation confirmed. The SS Kulpnachavla well on its way to the International Space Station. Cam initiated. Attitude nominal. LC, ace out. All right, ace, uh, great job calling it out. This is Mission Control Houston. Cygnus now safely in orbit en route to the International Space Station. A perfect launch from the Wallops Flight Facility in Virginia. Following its rendezvous with the orbiting outpost, Cygnus was captured by the space station's robotic arm and mated to the Unity module's Earth-facing docking port. It'll remain attached to the space station until around mid-December. During this time, it'll be unloaded and then filled up with space station trash and undocked to fall back to Earth, burning up in the atmosphere during re-entry. The star attraction among the 3,600 kilograms of fresh supplies and equipment aboard Cygnus is the space station's new toilet. The new orbital outhouse is being tested on the space station before the design's approved for use on the Artemis missions to the Moon and Mars. Officially called the Universal Waste Management System, the new interplanetary potty is smaller and lighter than the current space toilets, with redesigned restraints better positioned to allow astronauts more comfort as they try and achieve, well, splashdown in the zero-gravity environment without getting bogged down. The new Celestial Kazi includes a 3D-printed titanium cover for its dual fan separator, which should be more reliable than the existing design, which dates back to the space shuttle and has been known to break down on occasions. Also included is a new urine transfer system, which further automates waste management and storage while increasing the amount of water recovered and recycled for reuse. That's right, in space, yesterday's coffee becomes tomorrow's drinking water. One of the engineers behind the new system, Jim Fuller from Collins Aerospace, is speaking with NASA's Melissa McKinley. I know it's a toilet and I get a big laugh from my friends all the time, like, oh, he's, you know, he's building a toilet. And you're like, ah, not just a toilet, you know, a titanium space toilet. So (laughs) uh, it's pretty nifty, especially when you get into the complexities of it. The UWMS is 65% smaller and 40% lighter than the current toilet used on ISS. Our toilet will be installed just adjacent to that toilet and will undergo a concurrent use with that toilet as we do the demonstration. One of the things the UWMS has to do is it actually has to inject pre-treat into the urine before it sends it to the urine processor assembly. Uh, The pre-treat is a very strong acid and it uh, is not very compatible with a lot of materials so that forced us to have to use a lot of exotic materials such as Inconel, Elgiloy, titanium. So one of the coolest things that we actually did on this project is we implemented a process called electron beam powder bed fusion. That's just a big fancy word for 3D printing. You know, when we go to the bathroom here, gravity pulls everything to the ground, essentially away from the body. Well, in microgravity, when you go into space, you you don't have that luxury. So we have to essentially create our own artificial gravity. So at the heart of the UWMS is called is the dual fan separator, and that's actually the part that's actually made out of the 3D printed titanium. Exploration is is a hard business. It's it's uncomfortable. There's a lot of things that the crew has to do just to to, to explore. And the goal with the UWMS is is to to meet the challenges of spaceflight in terms of mass and volume and and power usage and, and keep within those constraints but also make it a a system that the crew has a a more likelihood to be comfortable with. Associated with a new space toilet is a new electrochemical ammonia removal system. It'll ultimately help with water recovery on long-duration missions to the Moon and Mars and could also be used to provide a vital supply of drinking water in remote and arid areas on Earth. Camilla Morales Naves and Dr. Carlos Cabrera, who are with the University of Puerto Rico, are the principal investigators on the experiment. NASA is looking for strategies to take advantage of the waste generated in the International Space Station. And one of those, wa- of those uh, waste is hearing. After certain processes, the hearing can be converted to ammonia. And the ammonia can be used as a fuel, in a fuel cell. The project intends to 
help with the water recycling and also generate uh, electrical current. And ammonia oxidation is just one component of a process that has been developed in the lab for the several years now uh, that can be used to purify urine. This will create a system that can be used for that. So this is more than an application for the space station. If it's efficient in the space station, it's more efficient in Earth. So, so that's sort of what we want to demonstrate, that it can work. Also aboard Cygnus are a new crop of vegetables to see what grows well in the space environment. Previous experiments have grown different types of lettuces and greens. This time they're looking at radishes and cultivating seeds to see how different light and soil conditions affect growth. As explained by the experiment's principal investigators, Dr. Carl Hassenstein from the University of Lafayette and Tech Shot Operations Director David Reed. The objective of the experiment seems very simple and it is growing radishes on the ISS. I know that radishes have been grown uh, several times, but never in the advanced plant habitat where we have actually enough space to grow a number of plants that allow us to do some statistics. Plant habitat is currently the largest, most complex plant growth system on the space station. The actual growth volume itself for plants measures about 20 by 20 by 20 inches cube. So all the rest of the volume of plant habitat is all of the stuff that it takes to provide a controlled environment for the plants that are growing inside of the growth chamber. Radishes grow to a sizable volume and a big piece of that mass is the radish itself, that bulbous tissue and the process of developing this secondary tissue is completely unresearched in space. But it is relevant because it is sensitive to all these things that we have on station. So it adds to this um, rather complex set of data that we need to get a handle on to properly grow and understand the cultivation of plants in, in space. To go to Mars is a long haul, and to go any further than Mars is longer yet. So without a doubt, unless we are going to have space vehicles that have rotating elements that can provide some fractional gravity, uh, there's going to be a microgravity area. And in, in order to grow a reasonable amount of plants, we're talking about, a, about much larger systems. And so this experiment is, is one way of trying to get a little closer. There's also a microgravity messenger RNA cancer experiment studying new drugs for treating leukaemia. Josef Okul and Kafi Ozdemir from Cornell Biologics are the experiment's principal investigators. We've been developing cancer cell-specific biological drugs that can selectively and effectively go after cancer cells. And we uncovered that cancer cells have a oral language that they only speak in the body. This allows us to exploit this language to encrypt our biological drugs in that foreign language so only cancer cells can understand us. So we're doing this extreme form of stress testing under microgravity. That is our first achievement. If we can identify at least one candidate that is resistant to leakiness in normal cells, despite being pushed to this microgravity conditions, then there's a good chance that when we go into the clinic with hundreds of different types of cancer cell ribosomes, cancer cell biomarkers, then we will be able to still rely on this asset for clinical development. The astronauts will take our cells and put them in, into back into the proper 37 degree cell culture incubator. And then with syringes, they are gonna apply our reagents into the cancer cells uh, and the healthy cells. And then the next day, they are gonna do the readout and uh, see whether this differential behavior is uh, recapitulated in uh, microgravity conditions. This is all about betting on the right assets for future development because drug development is costly and it takes time. And we're also, we're also building hope with patients. We want to identify the best candidates for them. Meanwhile, Felix Lajones and Paul Raphael from Felix and Paul Studios are supplying the space station with a new customised 360-degree virtual reality camera 
as part of a new documentary project about life on the orbiting outpost. Uh, for the past two years, we have been in uh, intensive production on a project called Space Explorers, the ISS Experience that is filming inside and outside of the International Space Station through the uh, immersive power of virtual reality. And in a few months, we're gonna take the camera outside to uh, document a full spacewalk and to film exterior shots of the space station as well as shots of planet Earth. What we are doing now is getting ready to launch our EVA virtual reality camera, which is a slightly different system to the IVA uh, camera that we've been using for the past two years inside of the space station. We worked in collaboration with NanoRax uh, to make it basically resistant to the pressure of space, um, the uh, extreme uh, variations in temperature, so we had to uh, make sure that the lenses were also certified for, for use outside. And we're basically going to use Dexter and the Canadarm as kind of a celestial crane uh, as you would in, in, in the movies, uh, to shoot outside of the ISS. Beyond the ISS, of course, are a lot more places to explore. So this has really been, uh, you know, valuable knowledge to help us design future cameras that are going to go deeper into space. Once audiences experience it, I believe they will not want to go back to traditional media uh, to uh, experience space content, you know, it's, it, it, it's going to be the sort of default fast track. Space equals immersive media. And because of that, um, I think that we're going to be busy in the next few years doing more and more and more of those projects. And time now to take another brief look at some of the other stories making news in science this week with a science report. There are growing fears today that one of the world's most important food crops, the sweet potato, could become another victim of global warming. A new report in the journal Nature Climate Change found a Peruvian study of nearly 2,000 Coumarel sweet potato strains discovered that less than 7% are heat tolerant. Scientists will now focus their efforts on these few heat-tolerant varieties, hoping they can be used for breeding programs to help crops adapt to predicted temperature increases of between 1 and 6 degrees Celsius expected because of climate change by 2070. Australia's National Science Agency, the CSIRO, has provided the first ever global estimate for microplastics on the seafloor, with the results suggesting there are at least 14 million tonnes in the deep ocean. A report in the journal Frontiers in Marine Science claims plastic pollution is being found throughout the oceans of the world, including Australia's Great Barrier Reef Fort Heritage Area. The amount of microplastics recorded was 25 times higher than previous deep-sea studies. Based on their origin, microplastics are generally divided up into primary microplastics, such as microbeads in face wash and toothpaste, or secondary microplastics, including fragments from plastic bags or fibres from textiles. Once ingested, microplastic particles physically damage organs and leach chemicals. These can range from hormone-disrupting BPAs to pesticides that can compromise immune function and retard growth and reproduction. Both microplastics and the chemicals they release accumulate up the food chain, potentially impacting whole ecosystems, including the health of soils in which we grow our food. And because microplastics are also in the water you drink and the air you breathe, they're also affecting humans. Paleontologists have described the new genus of Mosasaur, naming it Natomortostatin Annie. The giant marine reptile from the age of dinosaurs swam in the seas of what is now Colorado during the Cretaceous period between 79 and 81 million years ago. A report in the Journal of Vertebrate Paleontology claims the 10-metre-long specimen was originally classified in a different genus, but was reclassified following the discovery of portions of the Mosasaur's skull roof, jaw and brain case. The new name is derived from the Greek and Latin words for jaws of death. Well, even though you think your dog's gazing lovingly into your eyes, a new study suggests that dogs' brains don't process faces the same way humans' brains do. 
The findings, reported in the Journal of Neuroscience, claims that the canine visual system is organized differently to that of humans, and so they don't have the same reaction to seeing a face. The team measured brain activity in humans and dogs while watching a short video of other humans and dogs. Human brains showed increased activity in response to seeing a face compared to the back of the head, and increased activity when seeing a human compared to a dog. On the other hand, dogs' brains were more active when seeing another dog and there was no difference when seeing a face or the back of a head. Well, like most of you, I don't upgrade my technology every year, but rather wait until the new technology has something that I want. But one guy who I can imagine standing in a line stretching around the block at the local Apple store is Alex Sahara Royt from ity.com. Of course, when you're Alex, you don't need to do that. The product's sent to you. And he just got his hands on the new Apple Watch Series 6. So, Alex, is the upgrade worth it? Well, I've had it for a few days now. Whilst it's not necessarily a must-have upgrade if you're already happy with your Series 4 or Series 5 watch because it looks the same and has that larger screen that the Series 4 brought in over the previous Series uh, 1, 2, and 3. But uh, it's definitely a big upgrade from the Series 3 and earlier. And it has some exclusive features that the cheaper Apple Watch SE, which also got launched this year, doesn't have. Now, the SE uses the same chip as last year's Series 5, but it doesn't have an always-on display as the Series 5 and 6 have, and it doesn't have the ECG to check your heart rhythm, although that's not available in Australia as yet anyway. But the Series 6 definitely improves on the Series 5 from last year in four main ways. One, it's got that always-on display, but in sunlight, it's two and a half times brighter. Now, I've directly compared the always-on display of the Series 5 to the Series 6, and definitely it is brighter in the daylight. and also, because the screen is brighter, when you tap on an icon on the display or you push the digital crown on the right-hand side, the watch doesn't have to light up into the brighter mode first, as is the case with the Series 5 or previous watches where you had to tap the screen or push the crown for it to light up from black to mm. showing you something. So it just opens up whatever you tapped on or it brings up the menu of apps when you press the crown. So that by itself is faster. But it also has that 20% faster chip which runs apps 20% faster as well. And it's got a blood oxygen sensor for wellness. Now they So this go is all COVID-19 good then? Well, it goes to great pains to say that it's not medical grade, but uh, if your blood oxygen level is low, it could be one of the signs you have it. So yeah, it's good for COVID. And you also have the hand washing mode that you've got to switch on in the settings of your phone, not to watch. But that has a countdown for, of 20 seconds and a little animation and bubbles. And, the, and at the end, it gives you the thumbs up. Oh, it's like a little you vibrator can, on your electric toothbrush. That's right, yes. So you can, you can sort of, without look, having a look at the watch, you can feel mm. it. You've washed your hands for enough time. And also you can switch on a reminder so that whenever you come home, it also, after, you know, a few moments after you've arrived home, it says, oh, you should go and wash your hands. So those are little handy features for the new post-COVID reality that we live in. Okay, and Google's launched uh, a new Nest audio speaker. Yes, well, it's that last quarter of 2020, the time when a lot of companies are launching new things ready for the holiday and gift-giving season. And you know, as we noted, Apple will have its new 5G phone soon, but Google has launched some products. One is the Nest audio speaker. So this is selling for $99 in the US and $149 in Australia. Uh, Google says it's 75% louder with 50% stronger bass. And they, they're promising full, clear, and natural sound. Also has an ambient IQ mode that can adjust the volume of Google Assistant, news, podcasts, and audiobooks based on the background noise in the home. So you can hear the weather forecast, they say, over a noisy dishwasher. So that's you know a nice, intelligent feature. Also, Google has upgraded its Chromecast with a new remote control and the Google TV interface. So this basically brings it in line with the sort of experience you would get from the Amazon Fire Stick, Roku boxes, or the Apple TV. So it's, it's an app. TV operating system. It's $49.99 in the US, $99 in Australia, and it should prove really popular. It's got various apps like you would expect from other Android TV boxes or the Sony TVs that have the Android interface. It's got the Google Assistant that can answer all sorts of questions or bring up certain shows and apps. And it's got buttons on the remote for YouTube and Netflix, and I think it'll be very popular. And then you've got the Pixel 4a with 5G and the Pixel 5 with 5G. Both of these have two rear cameras. Uh, one is the standard camera. The other one is the ultra-wide lens, uh, which is very fashionable with today's phones. Now, you also have the uh, portrait light, which you illuminate your subjects beautifully. There's a new night sight and portrait mode that lets you have beautifully blurred backgrounds in portraits, even in extremely low light. 
And both of them retain the astronomy photography feature that debuted with last year's Pixel 4 that lets you take amazing pictures of the night sky. They also have a, uh, an improved Google Duo video calling app, which lets you share HD screens or whatever's on your screen with the other person. Uh, they, they're not using the latest and greatest Snapdragon processors in the sense of the highest model ones. They're using one down, the 765G. Most flagships use the 800 series processor. But it's got a punch hole display, so no more notches. You have this little hole where the front-facing camera is. 8 gig of RAM, 128 gig of storage. And the Pixel 5, which is the more expensive one, it's got wireless charging. Reverse wireless charging to, to reverse wireless charge other phones or wireless headphones and also has IP68 water and dust resistance. But there's one more piece of Google News. Yeah, that's right, the dropping of Daydream VR headsets. Yes, well, Google was one of the companies to really kick off the modern VR revolution when they launched a thing called Cardboard, which was a, a headset that you could put your phone into made from cardboard. And it had a little magnetic switch on the side that was sort of like the button to, to do something. And that sort of took the world by storm for a while, and people were showing you how you could make your own. But Google later on, just like Samsung, made its own physical VR headset. The problem is both Samsung and Google's Daydream VR headset are no longer on sale. It was sort of one of those things that really took off, but then it never really kicked on. And we now have HTC and Facebook's Oculus that really lead in the VR space. But uh, Google and, and um, Samsung, they basically gave up because people just weren't buying the devices. Now, it is a shame, but what it shows is that the future is in augmented reality, where you have a, um, some glasses in front of your face, and those glasses will show things that interact with the real world. So you're not cutting off the world, but you're seeing things overlay where it's Is direction. this sort of like a follow-on from Google Glass? Well, it is, but Google, Google Glass was very basic. It just had sort of simple icons for arrows for showing you directions in maps, but it was all very um, primitive stuff compared to what we've seen in science fiction and what's coming. It's probably going to be the case that when Apple launches its Apple augmented reality headset, that the rest of the world will finally figure out how it's supposed to be done, and then we can have copies and clones that will um, flood the market, and, and AR will be here, and we'll be able to put little things in front of the AR glasses to turn them into VR as well. But that's probably not coming until 2022 or 2023. That's Alex Sahara of Reut from ity.com. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcast, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpacetimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Space Time store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Space Time patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram through our Spacetime YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Spacetime with Stuart Gary. And Spacetime is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Spacetime with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com. 